Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a joy. We're going to get this out of the way right now. It's a seasonal tradition here. We go to David Blanchflower. He is in Hanover, New Hampshire, or he's in Florida, or he's in where he's traveling (laughs) in Wales, or that. David, Danny Blanchflower, describe, as we get to the job economy, describe the black fly season in Hanover, New Hampshire. It's like worst (laughs) on the planet, isn't it? It is. We uh, we're now in uh, mud season. And we've had uh, frozen ground for a very long time. Um, I came back here from Florida. We've had two snowstorms since. And then what happens eventually is the frozen stuff in the ground eventually right. melts. And uh, water flows down and the black flies appear. Right. So this is, this is not the greatest month to be in Hanover, New Hampshire. Right. But it's great to be with the students. And it's been great. And when it stops snowing, it's been right. raining every day. So it makes you yearn right. for Florida and yearn for New York City. But... You know, you do what you do. Right. <laughs> David, I, I want to go back to the wage curve and your iconic right. study of the agony, the pain of wage dynamics in the labor economy. The biggest single debate that I get in mail is people with bow ties saying the economy's pretty good. And thousands of people are telling me, Tom, you don't know what you're talking about in three zip codes in Manhattan. The labor economy's really weak. Professor Blanchflower, which is it? Well, obviously, there's there's kind of two worlds, but I think the story actually, if you go back to the wage curve and subsequent stuff, the unemployment rate actually no longer tells you much of anything about the economy. Just to put it technically, it's unrelated to wages. So I think people give you the wrong steer from that. The right thing to look at is, is basically employment. And the U.S. has a really big puzzle, unlike every other country in the world, in the employment rate in the U.S. today is below what it was in 2008 and below what it was in 2000. So that's an element of weakness. The other thing to say, basic to back the conversation that you just had, if you look at what's happened on the employment on the household account, the decline in jobs in the last eight months or so is greater than it was in in the months from from February 2008 through 2007. So there's conflicting evidence. Some people are really feeling weakness. Other people are seeing strength. And I was just looking to think about that question, Tom. Obviously, you you look at the non-farm payrolls and it looks really good. And and obviously, the economy has been pretty resilient. But I was just looking at in front of me at the, the Conference Board Consumer Confidence Surveys. The Expectations Index, which basically predicts recession, is essentially saying we're in recession, have been in recession for quite <laughs> a long time. So there's this conflict, and obviously part of it is a political conflict. Republicans say the economy is doing pretty badly, and the Democrats say it's doing pretty well. So it's a really pretty confusing picture. Uh, I think the answer is the economy has been more resilient, but we've had to put up with with an inflation shock. So it's a kind of poised answer. But I think, uh, and I have a new paper that people can go and see in Economica, where Phillips published his original paper, showing you that there's much more weakness here than you would have thought for the strength of the economy. Professor Blanchard casting shade on the household survey, Tom. I mean, it's clear he's an establishment survey kind of guy, but no, in all seriousness. He's cruel and unusual. (laughs) The big question facing markets, uh, Professor Blanchard, for me anyway, isn't, you know, whether the Fed will cut rates, but why? Talk to us a little bit about whether or not you feel below target inflation is enough of a case for the Fed to justify rate cuts this year. Well, it's probably not enough. I mean, the analogy I always like to give is go back to think where you were in, say, April, May, June, July 2008. And the discussion was much like this one, saying, you know, our rate the cuts coming, inflation is 5%, you know, it's going to be 8% in the future. Well, that story was clearly wrong. 
Um, uh, so, so the answer is, well, what is what is the Fed going to do? I mean, I think the answer is we're waiting for some data. I mean, I think the really important data is spent, despite the con consumer confidence data I've just talked about, people have continued to spend on services. They continue to go to the Broadway shows. The question is, is there anything that's going to prevent that? Uh, the, the other thing I would say, um, Damien and to Tom, and, is that it always strikes me as kind of funny. I mean, I always thought when you set interest rates, your job was to think about what inflation was going to right. be in 18 months' time. So what, what the inflation print was this month or next month or the month after was only relevant if it was a surprise. So I just find it really hard to understand for someone who set interest rates 36 times, why people think that a single data point is going to impact what the Fed does. The Fed should be thinking about what inflation is going to be in 18 months. And as far as I can tell, all the indicators are that it's going to be well below the target, which actually says you should be doing rate cuts. So that's the really big debate. Why does the Fed think that a, 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 an inflation print next month is going to severely change their view about right. what interest rates right. will be in 18 months? I mean, the reason being that it takes 18 right. months for anything for you to do to have an impact. So I find this discussion wholly disheartening. And, and in a well, sense, it's like, well, well, why do they think changing interest rates will affect inflation in a week's time? It doesn't make any sense Dan, to me. we got to go. Don't be a stranger. Thank you so much there. But I really cool. wanted to get Professor Blanchard around with this huge response to Tom. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs>
And then, and then when things get bad and cash flow freezes up, contagion is threatened, then they step in and ease conditions a little bit, then they start over. So this is a long cycle and it's a really difficult one. Leland, President Xi hosted you know, business execs out of the US, C-suite executives just last week, trying to entice them, tell them, hey, China's open for business. Then just today, China's telling telco carriers to phase out the use of foreign chips, Intel, AMD. You know, What should we believe here? I mean, is China really open for business from the perspective of a foreign investor? No, of course not. Like, always watch what they do, not what they say. You know, we, we joke about that on the stimulus front. They talk about stimulus every day of the week, but they're not stimulating <laughs> in a big way. You know, so yeah. this, you know, it's the same thing applies to foreign investment. 2023 was the year of foreign investment in China. And how did they celebrate right. it? By cracking down on foreign businesses, by shutting down external data sources, by shutting down internal <laughs> data sources. Right. You know, this is this is the incoherence that that, that characterizes China policy these days. You know, Leila, you know, Damien and I, we like to talk. We went to China. We're experts on China. We go to the Mandarin in Hong Kong. We go to the Peace Hotel in, in Shanghai. You know, sometimes it's St. Regis in Beijing, and we say we went deep into China. Leland Miller, what's China's consumer like right now away from the madness of global Wall Street going to three zip codes in mainland China? That's, that's exactly the right way to characterize it. Uh, cyclically, March, the first quarter, looked better than it has been for a while. We were seeing retail pick up, services pick up. So cyclically speaking, you know, the, the, the consumer uh, was better off in the first quarter, uh, you know, spent more than they had in a long time. So it's, 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 it's bullish cyclically. But the most important backdrop is always the structural backdrop. Consum there is no consumer wave. There is no consumption push. There is no shift from investment to consumption happening in China because the Chinese economic model disincentivizes households. It disincentivizes consumer spending. So you're not going to see any big time shift. Structurally speaking, China is slowing down massively. There's enormous pressure on consumption. Uh, but look, cyclically speaking, we, ha we had a nice month in March and we had a, a, a solid first quarter. Well, we've got some pretty weak data on the trade front overnight, but I'm looking ahead to Tuesday of next week. Property prices, activity data, retail sales, IP, you get your GDP print. What are you looking for there? What data, what data point is most important to you? Well, most of these things we're ignoring. You know, like the the trade, for instance, you know, the, the numbers are weak, but it's off a pretty high base from last year. Uh, this makes it somewhat difficult. I think the most important thing to to, to keep in mind is how how are how are retail and services doing? How's the consumption side of the economy doing uh, compared to last year? The answer is it's doing better so far. Has property stabilized? Property has stabilized so far uh, this year. How's manufacturing doing? <clears throat> Manufacturing did well in March. It didn't do well in January, February, but everyone thought it was collapsing last year. And I think we were the only people in the world saying, no, right. it's actually doing fine. And it is doing fine. So the, the economy's up from last year. And I think that's positive. You right. just have to have mild expectations in, ter in terms of where that's going. Leland, thank you so much. Never enough time. We've got to get you on for three hours at some point. The Leland Miller Show. She was at Harvard and went downstream to Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the most prestigious professorships in economics, the Gramlich Professor of Public Policy at Michigan, and now holding court at the Boston Fed. It is a perfect time for Susan Collins to speak to our Michael McKee. Let's listen. Let's start with the elephant in the room, CPI. It came in hotter than expected this past month, and now you have yourself and others suggesting we're not in any hurry to cut interest rates. Markets seem to be taking this as a policy turning point, is it? I wouldn't characterize it as a turning point. So let me, it's, you're absolutely right that the inflation numbers that came in this week were on what I would call the high end of what was expected. And if you look at the first quarter, uh, certainly inflation is elevated compared to where it was uh, as we ended 2023. At the same time, it doesn't change my baseline outlook that inflation will continue to come down with a healthy labor market. I just think it will take more time. And uh, it's premature to tell whether the elevated numbers that we just saw are a bump along that path or something more concerning. So I don't see it as a significant turn, but important to continue, continue to look at the data holistically and let the data tell us what's really going on. Well, the markets, uh, to go back to them, uh, have priced out everything except maybe one and a half rate cuts by the end of the year. Is it fair to say that unlike them, <laughs> 
you really don't know what you're going to do. Well, policy is not on a preset path. And I think that's important. I think there's a maybe understandable desire to have us map out exactly what's going to happen. But in the current environment, what's really called for is patience, being very methodical, and looking at the whole constellation of information, not just focusing on one data reading or another one. Um, and so what I would say is that we're continuing to form our outlook, recognizing that there are a lot, there are uncertainties and there are risks. So I call myself a realistic optimist in that sense, realistic about those risks and uncertainties, but still, for lots of reasons, very optimistic that we will see inflation uh, come back down and that labor markets will remain healthy. Well, how unconvinced are you that inflation is not going to come down as rapidly as you might have thought? Um, so I do think that we're going to uh, have to be patient and it may take more time. That is one of my takeaways from some of the data that we've seen. You know, at the same time, the data are mixed, Mike. So yes, the most recent inflation numbers have been elevated compared to what I might have hoped for. But at the same time, if you look at things like wage rates, so wage growth has been faster than it was pre-pandemic. But once you factor in the past price increases and importantly, the productivity gains we've seen, the wage growth that we're seeing is consistent with that trajectory back down to 2% inflation. Um, and I think that's good news for workers as well. But my point is that you need to look at the range of data and not focus too much on, on one piece and take the time to really see uh, what the takeaways should be. Well, you said yesterday that the danger of over tightening has kind of moved out of the picture at this point. Growth is strong, unemployment remains low, inflation is at least sticky, if nothing else. Why cut rates at all? So I wouldn't say that, the, uh, that there is no risk of us of, you know, uh, waiting too long. I do think that it's uh, two-sided. But to your point, I certainly do see more reason to focus on um, making sure that we don't uh, start easing too quickly. We're resolute. I'm certainly resolute about that commitment to bring inflation back down to 2%. You know, I do see policy as being moderately restrictive at this point. And it, in my view, will be appropriate as we get closer uh, to that trajectory. It will be appropriate to begin easing, but we're not there yet. So I don't think that we would indefinitely certainly want to, to stay where we are. Um, I, my baseline would still have us starting to ease later this year, but when I see is likely to be later than I had been previously thinking. I have to ask because everybody's going to bring up the question is, uh, does the election interfere with timing? Absolutely not. Um, I, you know, the, as I've said a number of times, Focusing holistically on the data is really what determines appropriate policy. And I have to say, there's enough of that to keep us very busy. So uh, that is my focus, and that's the focus of the committee. You mentioned policy is moderately restrictive. What tells you that? And how do you know what level of restrictiveness you need? So uh, in terms of the last piece, that's where watching the data comes from. Are we seeing the balance of performance that we're looking for over time? Um, you know, certainly there's evidence of some restriction. Uh, we've seen housing market reactions. We've seen um, some increase in delinquencies. We've seen some declines in uh, capital spending. And so there clearly is evidence in a variety of places. Labor markets are coming into better balance, and that's a really important one. At the same time, consumption and demand have remained uh, perhaps surprisingly strong given uh, where interest rates are and what we might have thought based on history. But, you know, we've seen in a lot of contexts the ways that the current context is somewhat different. So I would characterize where we are as policy is having a restrictive effect, which is what we want, but it's perhaps moderately restrictive. And that calls, again, for patience and being methodical as we look at all of the data. We've now got uh, pricing basically for a December <laughs> rate cut uh, as markets move back and forth. But my nerdy economist friends have spent the last two days putting PPI and CPI into the PCE calculations. And everybody is saying PCE is going to come in much milder than both of those. If that's the case, 
can we say June might be back on the table? So I don't want to speculate again, you know, not a preset path, and I think we have to wait to see what the data tell us. Um, but to my earlier point, the data have been mixed, and CPI and PCE don't always move in lockstep. They certainly are you know, very closely related. And so I think we have to wait and let the data tell us uh, what's happening. And again, um, it's not just the PCE, although that is certainly the preferred measure that we, uh, that we are focusing on when we look at our 2% target. It's all of it and how it comes together collectively. So wage data will be important. Um, when I look at the price data, I also want to disaggregate and look at what's happening to the different components because the dynamics there are different and that's informative for trying to understand uh, where we might be going, not just where we've been. The key question is where are we going and uh, what's that outlook like? and uh, trying to get to greater confidence before we change the policy stance. Uh, former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard once said uh, during the aftermath of the financial crisis, whatever you think the right rate for the country is, this isn't it. Uh, are you anxious to cut? Do you want to cut? Do we need a cut? Or can we live with rates at this level? Well, in the, you know, in the near term, I don't see urgency. Um, I had uh, been a bit concerned earlier uh, in the year, very early in the year, that there might be some signs of labor market fragility. Um, I'm seeing much less reason for concern, but that, again, is why I see the risks as being two-sided. So I don't see urgency, and I see lots of reasons for patience. And over the longer term, I think we'll, uh, my expectation is that we will ease and that over the longer term, inflation uh, interest rates will be at lower levels. But exactly what uh, that looks like, it's really premature to be too, too specific. The data may be mixed, but what are CEOs in your district saying about both uh, employment growth and also about whether or not they're still having to raise salaries and whether they're going to have to raise prices? So, uh, and we do have many conversations with um, people throughout our district, large firms, small firms, um, throughout New England. And what I'm hearing is a couple of things. One is quite a bit of optimism in terms of the economy's performance overall. Um, I'm hearing uh, information consistent with labor markets really coming into better balance, being easier to hire, except in a couple of sectors like healthcare, where that can still be quite a challenge. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, there are differences across different sectors and localities, um, but that uh, firms have not been expecting the same kinds of wage increases that they had needed before to retain workers, quit rates are way down, um, much less turnover. And, and that helps with productivity, right? Because if you are focused continually on having to fill those gaps because people are leaving and then you have to train people to come up to speed, it's hard to maintain that productivity that firms really need. And that's part of the good productivity story that we've seen that has helped with economic growth and helped us to bring inflation down uh, as much as we did in 2023, despite the fact that um, growth has been continue to be so robust. So there's a strong supply side story there as well. Well, productivity is one half of potential growth, and you're talking about productivity being good. A lot of argument these days that we're seeing more immigration than we're really accounting for, and that uh, basically potential growth is higher than we thought it was. Do you agree with that? So I certainly have seen increases in labor supply as being a key part of that um, supply improvement story that has certainly benefited the economy. Um, and the labor supply increases have uh, included immigration, uh, and there's been a lot of work um, which has uh, you know, come from different uh, people finding similar stories in terms of the increase in immigration playing a role. But we've also seen an increase in labor force participation, uh, particularly in prime age workers that was not anticipated. And really notably among prime age women, even though we know that the Childcare challenges continue, and those are really quite stark. So there have been some surprising uh, supply improvement news, and uh, we'll have to see the extent to which those continue. But it's certainly been an important part of the story so far. One last uh, question for our money market desk friends. <laughs> that is, you had a staff briefing and a discussion of whether or not and when to taper uh, quantitative tightening. Uh, the agreement, apparently, according to the minutes, was that you should announce it fairly soon. Can we expect something like that at the June meeting? So no decisions were made. 
the um, minutes uh, talk uh, summarize the discussion that we had, and it really draws from lessons from the past period of quantitative tightening from 2017 to 2019. And some of the key lessons from that experience are uh, the importance of doing the um, you know, the tightening, in other words, runoff of the balance sheet in a way that is smooth and does not cause stresses. You know, that pr proverbial, should be like watching paint dry, right? It shouldn't be uh, unexpected. And so the, uh, uh, there was broad agreement that slowing the pace, which is currently about twice as fast as it had been in that earlier period, um, and doing so sooner to ensure that it continues to be quiet and orderly and passive in the backgrounds, broad agreement for that, and also to start that uh, sooner. But no specific decisions have been made yet. So we could get taper before we get a rate cut. Um, th those things are, I see them as being independent. So uh, that could happen. Susan Collins, thank you very much for joining us today here at Bloomberg on Bloomberg Radio and Television Worldwide. We'll send it back to you. Michael McKee, thank you so much with a gentle lady from the Boston uh, Fed. This is really important. I'll put out a tweet and there'll be like some announcement. I'll go dot, 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 anticipated. This is the anticipated book of the fall. Christopher Whalen and his staff are knee deep in through the summer rewrites of his classic inflated, how money and debt built the American dream first edition. We're gonna give you a front run on the second edition right now. Your book's gotta be radically different given the debt and deficit mess we're in right now. Oh, certainly, Tom, and thank you for that wonderful plug. Uh, the last two chapters have to be rewritten. Uh, <laughs> in the past, we were more worried about the dollar. Does the election matter to you? No, not in the grand scheme of things. I think it's we're, we're nearing the end of the progressive wave of the past century, which was largely driven by my ancestors So it's and FDR's their hard work. fault, right? No, it's just that when a society takes on too much, eventually the demographics tell you what's going to happen. And we have fewer and fewer workers and more and more old people. So we're going to be consuming capital. You know, Bob Duggar, the retired partner at Tudor, wrote a great piece about the coming drought of savings in International Economy magazine. And that's, that's yeah. what's going to drive policy. Bob Duggar is one of the most original, out-front thinkers I've known in the act for years. Yeah. Absolutely. He's like really twisted and different. Damien, dive in. Well, Tom, I, I mean, I appreciate you plug. I'm, I'm going to plug another book. I'm going to take you back to 2014, Chris Whale, and let's talk about you know, financial stability, fraud, confidence, and the wealth of the <laughs> nations, your book back then. Let's think about the lessons learned from the last global financial crisis and now what we're seeing today with these markets. I mean, how should investors be looking? What, more importantly, what indicators should they be looking at to say, you know, hey, things aren't right here. Things don't smell good. Well, the way I look at banks, you know, we published some bank indices earlier this year, and we weighted quality versus size. Now, you can't ignore size, but my attitude is if you want to be safe with banks, you want to own the top 25 out of the top 100. So that's a pretty harsh cut. You're basically saying you want to avoid two-thirds of them or yeah, three-quarters the of them. Damien, right? uh, J.P. Morgan, 196 down to 188. Oh, right. well, wait, let's just talk about that, Chris. Let's, let's unpack that a bit. You're talking about owning from an investor standpoint, Correct. right? You're not talking about keeping your deposits with banks. No, but whether you care about income yeah. or alpha, yeah. you want to know where the good ones are. And so, for example, we just wrote a, a piece about uh, Bank OZK, George Gleason. Well, George is a little bank, but he <laughs> produces a lot of construction and development loans. People make the mistake of thinking he's in commercial real estate lending. He's not. He lends in the beginning of the life cycle of the asset, then he gets out. Very smart. So talk to us about the big bank, little bank. You know, talk to us about that dynamic. You know, I mean, is that not going away soon? Do you see that wedge, that divergence in the performance between big and small banks continuing? Well, in terms of financial performance, the smaller banks do better. Yeah. They have more pricing power. Mm -hmm. They tend to have much more operating leverage, too, much lower efficiency ratios. And this is why Jamie Dimon is so remarkable. Since he bought uh, First Republic, his efficiency ratio has been in the mid-50s, which is painful for everyone else because they're in the 60s, low 70s. If you want to well, compete with Jamie, you've got to have a five-handle on it, efficiency. Folks, inflated is a twisted book. I mean, <laughs> I mean chapter to chapter to chapter. It's, it, the only one I know that comes close to you is Mariano Mozzicato, who's doing a Marxist thing over in England. 
And in Mazzucato and you go chapter to chapter and say, hey, you can't understand Bloomberg's surveillance unless you know your history. Yes. Are we heading towards a fifth national bank of the United States in a combo of J.P. Morgan and Bank of America? I, I think America is headed to a large restructuring that is very similar to the 1930s when the Reconstruction Finance Corp essentially re, yeah. re, restructured yeah. everything that wasn't solvent. Right. I got to shift gears here, Damien. I want you to climb on board this insight. Mm -hmm. CRE, and Wayland's led the discussion on this, mm -hmm. is different now because we have Twitter. So you're at home or whatever, you're out on the road, I'm walking vet bill, mm -hmm. and I got Twitter up, and it's one guy with a genius walkthrough of how something that was 100 million is now 18 million yeah. in real estate. Right. I mean, yeah. social media, Damien, has changed the CRE debacle. No, I agree with that. And look, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the death of CRE and CLOs and other securitized products for that yes. matter in this environment. And so, you know, just to move away from that, I really just want to kind of focus more on this concept of the big banks and how, you know, the big 20 and those are the ones you want to focus on. That's still 20 banks, right? And yes. there's a big difference between Citigroup and JP Morgan. So yeah, help educate you. Like, what are you looking for? How do you differentiate between those big banks in terms of um, making an investment cape one way or the other? Well, you know, I've been doing this for a while. We've been building bank analytics for 30 years. And over time, you decide what's important. So equity returns, total um, market <clears throat> return, operating leverage, price to book. All of those things tell you kind of sort of the same thing, but from a different perspective. You know, for example, George has got one of the best performing banks in the country at Bank OZK, but he's still trading around book. Yeah. American right. Express is five times book. Okay? Very different right. franchises. Let me give you a market update here, Damien. Get ready for another question with Christopher Whalen. Yes, We're down two eleven on the Dow, negative thirty-two. Uh, pretty much lows here with the market open, fifty-one sixty-seven SPX. We are moments away from ninety-two Brent. We're not there yet. Ninety-one eighty-four just made a dash, didn't get there. 87 and change on NYMEX, gold 2416 and that's, this sounds like a data check yeah. from 20 years ago. You know, when you look at banks though, I mean, just going back, I mean, you look at an interest rate sensitive sector, right? And so, you know, I guess for me, you know, if I'm believing all this Kool-Aid that's going on in the market right now and I want to get defensive, you know, Chris, walk me through, how do you think about protecting investor assets in this market? Is it gold? Is it cash? Is it money markets? Is it something else? Well, I would be very careful with financials because we're still coming out of the COVID period when we had zero interest rates. This both helped and hurt. It caused problems and it also solved problems. Yeah. But going forward, you know, everyone was fixated on net interest margin. Right. You guys had a piece on the Bloomberg this morning. No, it's about spreads. And guess what? Net totally interest agree. margin is going to totally be flat agree. rest of the year. What's so important, folks, of Bloomberg surveillance worldwide, what you just heard from Mr. Whalen is a completely different world from Gina Martin Adams, and yet they came to the same conclusion <laughs> on financials. That's really important. Two twisted, ornery, different views, <laughs> and the same conclusion is be careful out there. Yeah, and dividend yields are now, I mean, earning yields are now far less than fixed the yields you can get in fixed right. income, right? So, I mean, you know, it, it's got that mountain to climb also if we go into sort of a risk-off environment. You know, last question, Chris. I mean, talk to us a little bit about, you know, when you do look at equities and you take a step back, how do you approach that? Are you looking at big versus small caps? Are you looking at tech versus other sectors? I mean, we talk about the banking sector, but what else is out there? Well, look, half of my book is either preferred or debt. The other half is equity. I rode NVIDIA up. I kept <laughs> stepping off because it was too big. It was a third of my portfolio at one point. Um, and finally, I got out a couple months ago. Um, so there are opportunities. I owned Chevron. I owned some other things. But in terms of the banks, I own U.S. Bank, Common, and Wells. That's it. Everything right. else is a preferred. So if you want exposure to financials, look at the preferreds because there's a lot less volatility. Dan, Daniel Paris with a real con controversial book out who says we got to get back to the time we remember where dividends mattered. Yes. Are stock buybacks a dividend equivalent, Chris Whalen? No. No, it's a, it's a different thing. Why? Discuss that. Stock buybacks are basically about feeding the street. It's kind of the vig you have to pay to the guy on the corner, you know, who works for Blackstone or, you know, whatever. So to me, dividends right. are a more honest way to return cash to shareholders because I don't have to pay a fee. Right. You know? which, 
Yeah, we're trying to get you here with 92 a barrel to create some drama. 91. Look, I'm with you, Tom. Come on, give me the tick, guys. I triple need a, digits. But I, I, need, I need a. Are, are you predicting triple digit oil? Uh, when that missile flies and hits uh, real estate in Israel, yes. Look, the world is at war. We never talk about this. The world is in a low intensity conflict that's about to get hotter. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why Jamie Dimon, by the way, is talking about geopolitical when everybody else right. wants to talk about NIM. I mean, think about, think about yeah. what Chris is saying here. Since the October 7th invasion, right, as Hamas right. spreads are tighter, oil well, is relatively, uh, maybe a little bit higher now, yeah. right. but, re but really the dollar is yeah. weaker. Damon, I mean, we're, we're staying in the script, Damon. we got to go to the news here. There's a lot of news out <laughs> there. Chris Whalen, I know you're in from Montevideo. Don't be a stranger. Chris <laughs> Whalen with a book out Columbus this circle. fall that will be must, must read. <laughs> Now, a look at the front pages. What's making news around the world? Your daily roundup of today's headlines from major publications. Bloomberg Surveillance, our daily newspaper segment, the Lisa Mateo Hour, brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Interactive Brokers, they charge dollar margin load rates from 5.83% to 6.83%. Rates subject to change. Learn more at ibkr.com slash Compare. I thought the newspapers were thick with stories today. What did you choose, Lisa? All right, so we're starting with the Wall Street Journal. Have you noticed around the office, we have them a lot here at Bloomberg, couches, right? They're everywhere. Everyone loves the couches. Companies trying to make the offices seem a little bit less stuffy to get people to come back in. Okay, so workers are saying they're more comfortable. Managers are saying it helps them think of these big ideas, you know, but experts are saying it's actually bad for your back. And this is the issue with, you know, you're balancing this laptop as you're trying to sit on the sofa. And then, you know, that can be an issue. And then it's also becoming more expensive expensive in a way because people are not taking care of their sofas, so they're spilling their coffee, they're eating their food. So now the companies have to make this expense and have the are sofas cleaned every so often. When I, when, your your when pretzels are all over the place. Every day, 10.05, <laughs> and I'm on with the cheeses, yes. and you know, I, I, I clean up after myself with the cheeses. This is Sir Damien, what do you think here? As, uh, as he opens here? his no, bag, as I open my bag of chips. Oh, exactly. oh, oh, what a shock. Look, I, think, I think companies have long tried to make the office a little bit less stuffy. They do, uh, you know, they have restaurants, outdoor terraces. They, yes. ha they have signature scents, you know, these little diffusers in the office to make it smell. Smell nice. Smell nice. We mm -hmm. have that in my house. My wife loves that stuff. Ooh. Yeah, no, it's, it smells beautiful in my house. Dior. We gotta get Roses. one of those in what here. Are you, are you doing Hermes, <laughs> Dior, you know, what's up? <laughs> no, it's a, um, it's like that hotel collection. I don't know, I might have got us my wife. That's I what mean, it does. Yeah, I got to ask my interpreter. You know, she she controls my Lisa, bank account. Lisa, what do you think? Because, I mean, this is a huge I, debate where people are saying, people are saying that we're, we're coming back to the office. Mm -hmm. And Paul and I were really pushing against it. We're not sure we see it Monday. Tuesday yeah, we don't say it, it's it. Mondays and Fridays, it still seems kind of quiet around here. But, yeah. you know, Tuesday through Thursday, I, I think everyone just needs to kind of come back. I don't know. I'm kind of a little the aromatherapy goes a long way. I have to do it, so we're, I feel like everybody exactly. else should. <laughs> I think we're a little biased. What do you got next? Okay, the battle between boomers and millennials. It's starting to see this shift because millennials are now going to start competing with other millennials. Here's the reason why. Okay, so when they first entered the adult world, 2010s, right? So they bonded, they have this against adversity because it's harder for them to save for homes, right? So they bonded together. Millennials, yes, they're going against the boomers, but now it's changing. Boomers starting to fade in force. The new competition, here's the reason. Millennials who have benefited from family wealth. So you see the competition, the tension there. So now you have these millennials who can't afford to buy, buy their home, but you have these other millennials who can't because their parents gave them the money for it. What do you think, so it's this tension. I, I think the interesting statistic here, I mean, Lisa, is the fact that the average millennial had 30 has 30% 30 less wealth than the average yes. boomer by the age of 35. That's an amazing right. statistic. Yeah. And and I mean, boomers, they owned homes. Right. They had, you know, home equity wealth. Whereas, you know, I mean, today's uh, millennial, I don't think owns all that much real estate. This is the first time I've mentioned it. We're going to feature this on Monday with bank earnings today and a really full schedule, which you're going to slide it to Monday. Bloomberg News has done the absolutely definitive research project on majors in colleges. Mm -hmm. And to me, the divide, Lisa, is people that went to college like Damien Sassauer and got a real degree versus a lot of other people that just sort of slid through and they got this degree or that degree. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the millennial divide yeah, nope. is people with, you know, a legit STEM, a high energy degree. In the Bloomberg research, Paulina Kacheka has this, the, the Bloomberg research is 
absolutely definitive. We'll feature that on Monday. Yeah, Next. And, and it's tough because colleges are so expensive, too. So that's There's the other side she of the She folds thing. that into it with oh, your team. Good. Let's pay $400,000 to be a major in sociology. That's fun. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that works. It's going to work for you. <laughs> there yeah. you go. You'll love radio. Uh, so, so speaking of colleges, this is where I want to shift to. A lot more elite schools, they're returning to those standardized tests. So now Harvard, yeah, Caltech, they're you. starting to bring back the SATs. Um, Harvard kind of did this backtrack. They were going to make it optional for a few more years, but they changed their mind. Caltech did the same thing, um, so mm -hmm. they're starting to bring it back. But the shift started to happen, which is interesting, after the Supreme Court ruling that schools can't consider race and admissions, and this is where things uh, started to shift a little bit. That's Damien, what the article's what saying. Damien's living this in real time. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, look, I mean, all I know is um, I, I'm a fan of standardized tests. I do. I think you need that number to kind of differentiate, you know, the cream from the crop. And, you know, so I'm a fan of it, but at the end of the day, if I had a weaker uh, a student who, a son or daughter who wasn't yeah. a great test taker, I, I understand that it's, it, it can be a, a pretty big ask to ask him to sit down, to spend Lisa. hundreds of dollars on tutors Lisa. for the SAT, for the ACT. I was just going to say, I, I mean, just the spent of hundreds of dollars on okay. tutors. <laughs> Granted, COVID was in the way, yes. but I've had too many professors tell me it's been an unmitigated disaster. They, they, you know, finally Harvard's catching up with Dartmouth and Brown and, and all the rest. And there'll be a, a zillion of schools like MIT and Georgetown leading the way on this day. Yeah, absolutely. But, but the, the bottom line is professors say they got kids in class. They just can't do the, the work. work. Yeah. That's the bottom line. Well, did you see Ken Griffin is donating money to the public school system down in Miami to address just this issue because yeah. the, the COVID kids, ages who are in grades six to yeah. eight, you know, are, are suffering. Yeah. Lisa Mateo, thank you. Just really strong newspapers all through the week there. Lisa Mateo uh, with one of our most popular uh, efforts. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.